Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about simple fixes for home safety is Judy Levy. Judy's work experience ran the gamut from pediatrics, establishment of a, ho a hospital occupational therapy rehabilitation program, work in a home rehabilitation program, to educational as a local college occupational therapy guest lecturer, and finally teaching the occupational therapy component at a home health aid training program. She wrote her book, Activities to Do with Your Parent Who Has Alzheimer's Dementia, after her mother's diagnosis. It was at this time Ms. Levy began speaking to caregiver training sessions and at Alzheimer's family support groups. The presented content does not provide or constitute medical, financial, or legal advice. The content is for information purposes only. Viewing or listening to the content does not constitute a physician-patient, dentist-patient, fiduciary-client, or attorney-client relationship. How are you doing today, Judy? Good morning, Jason. It's nice to be here. Yes, good to have you back. Last time we had you was in September, so I'm looking forward to our time together. Before we get started, Judy, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, if you have any questions, type your questions in, time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. So Judy, let's go ahead and get started. Simple fixes for home safety. So what we had decided, the two of us, on what kind of topic I would have this time, is safety and safety concerns. So I come at this as the occupational therapist that worked in a hospital, and I come at this as a daughter of a parent who had Alzheimer's, and a number of my patients had Alzheimer's, but general considerations for home safety is really consistent across the board. So some of the things that I want to talk about is emergency contact information. You may know what your parent takes as medication. You may know what your client is taking as medication, but if an emergency comes up, you need to have the emergency information at hand so that you can get to it. So the question goes, where do you keep that information? Does the daughter in Tuscaloosa, Alabama have it and you're in the West Coast of the United States? It does you no good. So you really want to put emergency contact information in your smartphone. You want to put emergency contact information on a piece of paper next to the telephone in the kitchen. You want to put it, if you don't have a telephone in the kitchen, you can put it with a magnet on your refrigerator. And things that we've done for seniors in senior housing is we've taken a list of all their medications and all their doctors and the dosages and the contact information, rolled it up, put it into a little glass vial and put it into the refrigerator with a sticker on the refrigerator that says emergency contact information is located within the refrigerator so that everybody that's dealing with that person knows where to get the emergency contact information. The second thing on my list is color contrast and sometimes it's confusing for people's who have for for those people that have older eyes to see the difference between near and far and depth because if you've painted your floor beige if your floor is beige and your walls are painted beige and your sofa is beige you can't necessarily see outlines of objects you can bump into things you can hit walls color contrast is really important because it allows you to see something more clearly and right now i'm looking at jason and and the sign that says ka and the color difference of the blue against the white and the orange of the shirt against the white is giving enough contrast that allows you to see something clearly. So color contrast is good. Clutter. Everybody likes to save things that are important to them, but as you get older, it's harder to make decisions if you have to separate clutter out to make a choice. So if you have somebody with cognitive loss, and you want them to choose between one to two to three items, and you have every single article of clothing that they've worn for the past 50 years, you need to declutter. So closets, medications, things that are little knickknacks that are on your tabletop that can cause any kind of confusion. You wanna declutter and make things as streamlined as possible. And I know it's really hard for some people to let go of things, but as confusion comes, too much clutter causes problems. Lighting. Lighting is a biggie. 
So there's the problem now is all the light bulbs. There are so many different kinds of light bulbs. There's so many different kinds of light. And personally, we just had a light go out in my shower and I had to get the right kind of light bulb and they had daylight and they had bright light and they had white light and lighting is a big issue. So if, if some lighting is too harsh, it's uncomfortable. If some lighting is too dark, you can't see to make a decision to see where you're going. It's causing confusion. Lighting is really important. If you have dark corners, consider putting in a pole lamp so that you're lighting the corners of your room evenly. So lighting is important. And we even just had a discussion before this webinar started about having appropriate lighting so that you can see into the background. Lighting is very important. Telephones. Telephones are about to, as confusing to me as light bulbs. You can have a smartphone, you can have a dial phone, you can have a flip phone, you can have Android. I don't understand telephones anymore, but you need to have a phone that stays charged that allows you to contact people in case of emergency. Some of the senior phones that are out there have pictures of relatives or doctors on it, so you don't even have to dial. It's been pre-programmed. You push the picture of your desired person and it goes directly to that person. So the other thing is you should know where your telephones are. And as an aside, because I tend to do that, one of the things that I had with my mom is as her dementia progressed and she had dementia for 10 years, she went through a period of time where she called me nonstop. And I didn't think that chips that would take messages could ever get full, but I would get progressively more and more telephone calls from my mother. So it would be, Judy, call me. Judy, call me. Judy, where are you? Call me. What we ended up doing is we we tried first, we unplugged the phone, which is, sounds so simple, but she had a phone next to her in her bedroom, which initially was fine and later wasn't so fine. So we unplugged the phone in her room. And when she picked it up, there was no dial tone. We told her, oh, phones were down. Eventually we took the phone out of the room so that it wasn't a distraction for her because we had numerous episodes where she called the police for help and I had to go deal with the police. So telephones are an issue not only for accessing help and interacting, but they can be a distraction for someone with cognitive loss. Medical alert devices. Okay, so I like medical alert devices. Um, Personally, I got one for my mother and it wasn't pretty enough for her to wear, so she wouldn't wear it. So I offered to put rhinestones on it and she didn't like that either. She just didn't want it. But there are watches that are medical alert devices. There are necklaces. The biggest problem with medical alert devices is that people often take them off and you really wanna keep them on. So that especially if somebody gets up in the middle of the night and goes into the bathroom, if they don't have their medical alert device and they fall, the medical alert device is no good to them in another room. So medical alert devices are good. They need to be the kind that work outside as well as within your house. So some of them only work within a certain range of distance and some of them will go wherever you go. If you go to the supermarket and you need a medical alert device, you want a medical alert device to be able to go with you. The other thing about medical alert devices is that you don't have to be ill if you are alone in your house and you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and you are by yourself, a medical alert device is something that you might consider just for your own personal safety. It's a just in case kind of thing. Fire and carbon monoxide detectors. You need to change the batteries. If you don't, they're gonna start chirping. Mm. So my suggestion is to put the date on the carbon monoxide or fire detector that you change the battery, write it. You can put it on a Band-Aid on the outside so you don't have to damage or write directly onto the thing if that bothers you. And know to change it. 
The other thing that you can do is if you change it January 1st, put on your calendar, you're gonna change the batteries January 1st. You're gonna give yourself a new year present of not having a fire or a smoke detector that, that possibly won't work for you. So it's really important, it's really important. My husband and I moved into a condominium and we didn't know when the carbon monoxide detector battery had changed and it, it started to chirp. So we, you don't smell carbon monoxide. So we called the fire department and a lot of people came because carbon monoxide, you wanna just get out of your house immediately. So just as a final thing on my home safety page, fire and carbon monoxide detectors, they work as long as you continue to change the batteries. So that's something to be careful of. Okay, um, on entry and exit into your house, I talked about lighting and the general consideration. And here's another thing. If you have stairs or even just at your entry, be sure that the lighting is adequate to see the top and the bottom of your stairway. So if you're, if you're in an apartment building and there's lights at the top and no light at the bottom, or there's a section that's dark, consider putting one of those stick on lights that give you light along the way so that you can have adequate lighting the length of your staircase. The other thing is you wanna be able to turn the light off at the top. So if you don't need it anymore and you're going inside, you wanna be able to turn your light out. And the same as the reverse, when you come down the steps, you wanna be able when you're done to turn the light off. Timers work really well for turning the lights on and off. You could have them go on at, at sunset and have them stay on till midnight and then go off on their own. So light, lighting is, is big. The other thing is waterproof gridded paint on your outside steps and reflective tape on the edge of each stair. And that gets into vision with the reflective tape so that the light from your overhead light will reflect on it, you know where the stair edge is. Um, and you want that gridded paint to be um, a different color than the step. So if your step is gray, you might wanna put a white strip. The, I found that tape does not work as well as just painting it. And grit in the paint, I guess it's sand that's in it, you can get it at, at the paint store, at a uh, hardware store. Um, allows traction, improved traction. Um, weatherproof, especially the, the issue with weatherproof paint in the Northeast and in the North when you have ice, it's it, anything that's gonna give you more traction is better. And having lived in the Northeast for the majority of my life, I found that putting salt can work, works really well, but it damages the area. So sometimes people don't like salt. Kitty litter works very nicely. It, it offers traction and it doesn't damage the environment around it. So there's different things that you can do to stop slipping on outside steps. The suggestion to put handrails on both sides of stairs. So if you think that you have a handrail and you're good, make sure that handrail is sturdy. Sometimes you go and they're like, not really attached well to the side of the house. And you think you've done well, but you really may not have. So check that they're attached really strongly and consider putting a second one on the other side. So if somebody's had a stroke and one side is weaker than the other, when they go up, they've got the strong side. When they come down, they've got a strong side or if they're gonna progress up the staircase sideways up the stairs, they've got a good sturdy handrail to hold on. Wanderproof or childproof door locks. And the children's store is really kind of a good thing to look at, at safety locks, but I'm gonna just talk in terms of door locks at this point. And I see from my thing, I, I have said put a timer on outside lights and have a light switch at the top and the bottom. But the other thing that I just wanna mention here as far as safety locks, and I just ran to get it, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's a jewelry 
clip. And what it does is it's just a clip that makes, that opens and closes just by snapping it. Of course, it didn't do it now that I'm trying to do it in front of you. Um, there's circles that they sell in hardware stores that also just snap together. And I'm not talking about the ones like a key that you have to have the piece go around to twist it to get the key on. These circles are almost like, um, oh goodness, the kids use them. I can't think of what the word is. It's a long clip. If you have a doorway and people might wander, there's all different kinds of things to prevent people from wandering. But you do not want to have a lock with a key. In case of a fire, you want to be able to leave. And if you have to take time to get a key to open the lock to get out, you're putting yourself at risk for being caught in your house in a fire or some other kind of emergency. Or if you've called for help and somebody's coming to help you, they won't be able to get in. So <coughs> the, um, the chain lock, I don't know, it, it, I don't know what it's called other than a chain lock where you put the chain in and the piece goes in and you slide it back. The chain then gets longer. When you've pulled the chain in, it gets longer. And what you can do is you can take the link and you can shorten the chain. So if somebody is apt to wander, they go to open up the door. They One, they can't get the chain off because you've shortened it. And two, the door won't open enough to allow them to come out. The caregiver can just open it and do it. But oftentimes somebody that has dementia and is apt to wander and get out, this will be enough of a frustration to slow them down, to give the caregiver time to get to the door. Um, we had an issue with a caregiver who really, she was in the bathroom, she was taking a shower and my mother was a wanderer. So what we did is we used a baggy tie to shorten it, but it was too, after a while, the baggy tie was kind of not so great. So we took that off. The link works really well. So that's just an idea that's a simple little gadget that will help you. And when you want to go out, you just open the link, undo the chain, and you're good to go. So sometimes the, the stairway, the, the access in and out, if you can slow down the access, it gives the caregiver time to allow the person to be safe and the caregiver to take some time for themselves. And it allows the person to be stymied a little bit so they can't have such free access in or out. Okay. There was an article I just want to do as an aside on um, dailycaring.com. It's a website, dailycaring.com on March 8th. And what they did is they listed all different steps to prevent wandering. The article was really good. And if you have a wanderer that you're caring for, um, it's something to consider looking at. Okay, I wanna go into the kitchen. Okay. Everybody likes the kitchen. Everybody congregates in the kitchen. When you go to get things that are important for you in the kitchen, as you get older, you get, I hate this, you get shorter. My son-in-law just said to me, you're not depressed, you're just compressed. And I like said, ah. So where I used to be able to reach things on the top shelf, now I'm at a point I would need a ladder or a step ladder to get to the top shelf. I really don't wanna be climbing a ladder to lift something down. So the concern is to rearrange your shelves so that things that you use every day are within easy reach. So you can put serving pieces that you don't use on the top shelf and put a set of dishes or whatever you do use on the bottom shelf. If it's still too much to have it in a cabinet on the shelf, put it on the counter. This is for you, this is your kitchen, make it so it's accessible for you. So heavy objects should not be on the top shelf. And now that I'm living in California, I know that they tell you worry about earthquakes, which I never worried about in my life. And now I have to think, oh my God, I shouldn't have anything heavy that's gonna fall on me. Heavy things should be down below. Um, so where you live in the country will also determine <laughs> where you're putting things that might be heavy. Eliminate scatter rugs. 
scatter rugs are very pretty. Everybody loves scatter rugs. They look so nice. Um, there's a number, I wanted a scatter rug by my kitchen sink. And anything that I saw, I would put the rubber gripper underneath the, the rug, the mat right there, and the rug would still slide. So I, I didn't want anything that was gonna slide, but I wanted a rug because I didn't wanna stand on a hard floor at the sink. There are rugs that are out that the entire bottom is heavy, um, resistant material. And I, for the life of me right now, I found it on Amazon. They're heavy rugs. They come in different colors. They come in different patterns, but they're stable and they stay down against the floor. It does not slide. You can hose it down and it will dry off. It doesn't have to go in the washing machine. It is large enough. You can get in different widths that you can put it down, but it is not a slippery, slidey scatter rug. Um, they've come out with a gadget that our fireman was, was talking about that has an oven turn off. So if your stove or your, your, if your oven, no, if your, if your cooktop, I have to go, goes to overheat, it automatically shuts off. So that's something that you consider, can consider putting in your kitchen, but use a timer when you're cooking, have a timer that goes off so that if you, your sensory is smell is not what it was and you don't smell something burning. If you know that something cooks for seven minutes, set a timer for seven minutes. You can ask your phone to set the timer and say, I'm gonna not say it because my phone will do it, but you wanna give yourself a timer so you know when something will be done. You won't overcook food, you won't cause a fire. Go through your kitchen cabinets and get rid of food that's expired. If you think it's expired and you're not sure, throw it out. So you can take a marker from, a ma uh, uh, I was gonna say a magic marker. You can take a, a Sharpie pen that it's permanent marker and write on the cap expiration date so you know when the expiration date is so you don't have to look for that tiny little thing to figure out whether it's good or bad. If lids have bubbled, get rid of it. If something doesn't smell right, that's used to be an issue that something doesn't smell right, but with aging, sometimes smell isn't the same anymore. So it's not always the smell test. If something has hit an expiration date, rather than chance getting sick, throw it out. The other thing that I used a lot when I was working with patients that had strokes was a tea cart. And we called it a tea cart, but there's also, it's a television cart. I've seen them in Ikea. And what it is, they're either metal or wood and they're on wheels. And if you wheel that over to your counter, as you're cooking, anything that you have to carry from the counter to the table, put it on the tea cart and roll the tea cart to where you're going. It eliminates your carrying something potentially hot or heavy from point A to point B. It eliminates the chance of possibly falling with it, getting burned from it. So I really, I really like a tea cart. The other thing that um, I've done with people, with patients is ask them to wear an apron with a pocket. And this is good for being in the kitchen, being in your house, carrying things from upstairs to downstairs. It gives you a pocket to carry things, leaving your hands free. So if you're setting the table, Put the silverware in your pocket if you don't have a tea cart. If you have a tea cart, I would put all the utensils from the point A onto the tea cart and roll it over to set the table. Um, so the pocket in the apron also works really well. There's one other thing that I like and it, it, I didn't put it on here and that is a large coffee urn or a big, I don't, it doesn't have to be coffee, but a, a pot that keeps water hot that's plugged in. So if you're caring for somebody during the day and they want a cup of tea, if the water's hot, just leave it on during the day, as long as it's full, leave it on. You have the ability to, to get the tea and the water into a cup and you don't have to lift up a pot of boiling water. It also allows you to make, you can make instant coffee, you can make, soup with instant soup. You can use it, water for whatever. And even if you want to not use it for something hot, 
you can use that same premise for something cold there and for a glass of water or a glass of um, juice or whatever. If you put it into something large with a spout, it allows you to pour the amount you want rather than an entire container of something heavy that you have to lift up to pour. So it stands to reason to keep cords and telephone wires out of the way. And now that telephones pretty much are, 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 are smartphones, that's not so much of an issue, but cords to appliances are. So if you have a cord and it's loose, tape over it so that it's down and it's attached to the floor so you don't have a chance that you're tripping over cords. I put in remove scatter rugs, which is my same thing from the kitchen. When the floor is slippery, consider non-skid carpeting or even painting the floor with that gridded paint. It stops you from sliding. Um, I had m multiple issues with the housekeeping department in hospitals where I worked. What they like to do is to polish the floors and it looks really good, but people think that it's wet. And the problem with thinking that it's wet is that you're afraid that you're gonna slip. So if possible, if that's an issue in the facility where you're working, meet with the housekeeping department and ask them if there's a way that they can buff the floors that they're clean, but not wax the floors so that they're excessively shiny. Shiny floors look wet and can cause slipping. The color contrast, and I talked about that when I was talking about general considerations. If you've got white walls and white furniture, it's very easy to define the space by putting an afghan or a blanket over the back of the sofa or a chair. It gives you a visual break and allows you to walk around the sofa so that you don't bang into it, causing a possible fall. The issue with dementia is that oftentimes at dusk, there's sundowning and people get agitated as the sun goes down. So we get into good lighting to light up all the rooms and all the corners so that it isn't so frightening with shadows. And you wanna close the curtains because if you turn on these lights at sundown, you're getting a reflection on the windows, which is very disorienting and can cause agitation. So close your curtains as the sun is going down Make sure that the lights are adequate to fill all the room. It will help to prevent sundowning. The, the other thing that will also prevent um, agitation is if you cover mirrors. And if you, if you even put a sheet over the mirror or if you get the, um, it's the peel and stick that they have that you can, put on, on glass or on not uh, similar to contact paper, but it's easier to pull off that you could just cover the windows if you can't, the, I'm sorry, the mirrors, just to prevent, prevent the reflection. Um, that helps. Remove clutter. So it's the same thing in the living room. You really wanna prevent falls. So if people have knickknacks that are all over the floor and you have a, a lovely magazine rack that's holding all kinds of magazines and it's on one side of the sofa. It's something that really easy to trip over. Um, the other thing I put in, and just as a thing again with the light bulbs, if your room isn't bright enough, get a light bulb that's brighter, the bedroom. Cooler temperatures at night increase sleeping. So if you can set your thermostat, to be at a certain degree. Try not to have it too hot. It's better to have it cooler. You wanna put the phone and light switches within reach of the bed. Unless, <laughs> as I said before, you have a parent who wants to make constant phone calls. So in which case, don't put the phone next to it, but put the phone next to your bed, but not necessarily next to your patient or client or mother's bed. You wanna have the light switches within reach of the bed. If you can't have the light switch within reach of the bed, I don't know if you remember the clapper. Do you remember the clapper? When you do that and the lights go on or and the lights go off. A clapper is really good. And that can help you turn off the lights when you get into bed if the light switch is not adjacent to your bed. 
to prevent dizziness. Sit on the side of the bed for a few minutes before you get up. So what you really wanna do is bring your legs to the side of the bed. You wanna sit there and then give it a count of about just a minute and then stand up. Keep your medical alert device close to your bed if it's not on you. If you get up to go to the bathroom, take your medical alert device with you. Keep assistive walking devices close to your bed for easier access. If you're caring for someone and you think it's very nice to take their walker and move it away so that their bed is free, if they get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and they don't have their walker, they're an accident waiting to happen. So be sure that any walking device is close to the bed. Use a nightlight. And the benefit of using a nightlight is you really wanna light the way towards where somebody might go. And I like a nightlight that doesn't just go on as you're walking, you wanna keep it on. If you go on and you have a nightlight that goes on and then as you go past you, it goes off, You've got somebody that's trying to understand why the lights are going on and off. So a nightlight that stays on, and there are certain kinds that plug in that go on as, as it gets darker and then go off during the daylight. They're, they're plug in and they're little and they come in a package of three or four in a package and they're really good. Wear non-skid slippers with backs. So if you think that you're gonna get up to go marching around in the middle of the night and you have slippers with no backs, they can fall off your feet and they're really dangerous. So make sure that your slippers fit and make sure that the, your foot goes adequately into it so that you're not tripping because of the slippers. Okay, and I talked about walker glides. Did I talk about walker? I think I did it before. Um, Jason and I were talking about walk, tennis balls on walkers. Um, I, I personally hate tennis balls on walkers and they cause friction against the carpet, making it harder to push your walker across the surface of the carpet and they wear out. And you're not necessarily aware of it. There is a gadget called a, a walker glide. They come in two widths to fit into the bottom of your walker and they make it very easy to move the walker across the surface of the carpet in your bathroom, in your bedroom. Okay. My last list is the bathroom. So I was looking at on, on uh, the computer and it says, bathrooms can be the most dangerous place in the house after the kitchen. So 80% of all falls occur in your house. They're the most common cause of traumatic brain injury. 50% of people over the age of 65 will have a fall leading to death. Most falls occur on the same level, not on a ladder. 20 to 30% of falls lead to hip fractures, cuts and bruising. Falls inside the home um, lead, to hip, lead to hip fractures. Outside the home, it leads to forearm fractures. So the biggest issue is safety in the bathroom, again, Eliminate scatter rugs and instead use a non-skid carpet that goes across the entire floor. Put non-skid strips or those daisies into the shower tub floor. Apply a drilled in grab bar at the entry and exit side of the shower. There are grab bars that have um, grids on them as opposed to a smooth bar. The grid is, in my opinion, it's better because it allows you something more substantial to grip onto and not slide down. The other thing is they have um, grab bars that suction cup on. If you really need that grab bar and you grab that, you can't be sure that the suction cup's gonna hold. You really want somebody to put a grab bar into the stud in your bathroom. A handheld shower. So sometimes showers can be disorienting. If you're giving a patient a shower, a handheld shower works a lot better. A shower seat with the back goes into the shower that you sit down on. If you can't find one, they are available on, on Amazon, but they're also, you can use a backyard chair with no, with no arms because it's waterproof put it in the tub. If it fits flush onto the floor, as long as you've got something to sit on, but hope you want a back. If you have somebody that has a stroke and needs to transfer into the tub, you want a bath bench. And that's something that extends outside of the tub, allows you to sit down on the outside, 
swing your legs in and slide over at no point do you have to stand up uh i like soap on a rope and i don't know if you've seen it but soap on a rope means you're not going to drop the soap onto the floor of your shower that you're going to have to bend down to possibly fall to get it the other thing is they have a suction cup gadget that we used to refer to as an octopus it's a little round circle and it has little baby suction cups on both sides it goes against the side of the shower wall and the soap can stick against it and that too prevents the soap from falling to the floor you want to make sure that dry towels are within reach you want to have a phone nearby, or if you are in the same house as somebody that's taking a shower, get a baby monitor, turn the baby monitor on, and listen to the person in the shower. If they need you, you want to be able to hear them. The other thing, finally, is to ask the pharmacist for large print on your prescription medications, and they will do it for you. You just say you have vision problems and you want them to put the medication in large print. You had mentioned your mother was a wanderer. Were there other some some other safety measures that you can talk about that were most effective for your mother? Oh, she was very social. The the thing about wandering and and that article that other site gives you ideas is um, it's hard when it's your parent. That's that's just it's hard. But we put in her shoe her name and her address and her phone number and contact people and we put it in the shoe because she always put her shoes on and at least we knew that the information was there the other thing is i my mother made friends with people in the yellow pages now they don't have yellow pages anymore but she went through the yellow pages and she saw a neat picture and she called the person she got friendly with the person she invited them over so we had issues of safety of her bringing inappropriate people into the house. And that's when we ended up having somebody with her 24 seven, um, was a safety issue based on her interaction with other people. We also called the local police and first aid squad. And we made sure that they knew who she was, especially after we went through the phone situation where she was calling people about a hundred times a day, but. I'm exaggerating. She wasn't 100, but it felt like 100. Um, enough time that the police came in to my mother and said to her, do you know the story of the boy who cried wolf? And my mother said, yes. He said, well, you're crying wolf. And she said, she just looked at him. She said, well, do you have a gun? And it was like, <laughs> OK, that was what we dealt with. So things that you think you're going to have with a parent who was always very proper and always acted a certain way, all the rules are gone when you're dealing with cognitive loss. People are not necessarily what they were before. Safety, where you thought people were safe, they're not necessarily safe. You have to go step, I, I keep saying it, you have to step back and look at a person and look at them objectively so that the person that you remember, the mother that you remember, the father that you remember, acting a certain way, they may not act the same way anymore. And you have to be able to just look at it objectively to see what you have to do to change it. My mother loved to have a phone next to her in the room, in the bedroom. It just wasn't appropriate after a certain time. We moved it away. But it took a while before I realized what I had to do. So even if you think you know what you're doing, it takes a while to identify what the problem is and say, this is what I need to do to change it. So if your dad gets dizzy, if he bends down because he's dropped something in the shower, eliminate how things could possibly fall on the shower, the soap on a rope, the suction cup. If you have a, they have now in, in um, hotels, they have the soap that's attached to the wall that, um, is in a dispenser on the wall, which is really neat, that then there's no more soap. It's just you push a button and you get soap. Um, but if you have someone with dementia they want to get soap, and you have one that's soap and one that's shampoo and one that's conditioner, they're not going to know to make the, the choice. So you want one thing. You don't want three things. So the three things would be under the, the discussion of clutter. That's too much clutter. You can't make a decision. So um, make sure you understand safety contact information for you, 
make sure somebody else knows it. If an aide is in the house with your family member, make sure the aide knows the information. Don't assume that the agency that they work for has given her the information because of HIPAA laws. If you want to be sure that they're safe, provide the information. Well, Judy, how can people find you? Well, I have written a book called Activities to Do with Your Parent Who Has Alzheimer's Dementia. And if you go to Judith A. Levy, it's EDM. I have my master's in education. OTR, I am a registered occupational therapist. If you go to that on Amazon, you'll find the book. Or you can email me and I will answer you, I promise. DementiaActivities at gmail.com. And there's two A's in the middle. Dementia activities, the two A's in the middle at gmail.com. And I have gotten questions and I answer questions and I'm more than willing to, to speak with you or answer any questions that you have. Excellent. Well, thank you, Judy. Uh, excellent stuff. Always a pleasure having you. We'll thank definitely you. have to figure out what our next uh, collaboration will look like. Uh, <laughs> as far as Knowledgeable Aging, all of our content can be found on our website, uh, knowledgeableaging.com. You can also go to our YouTube page. Um, just type in YouTube, um, type in Knowledgeable Aging once you're on YouTube. I encourage you to subscribe. We update that a couple of times per week. Um, if podcasts are your thing, you can find us on Apple Tunes, Spotify, et cetera. Until next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging.